uh, on our panel we have Mark Light. Mark, you want to just so Mark is from University of Northumbria, Newcastle. Yun Tung Lin. So Yun is from Heist. Daniela Rosner, our pinch hitter, who joined us this morning from the University of Washington. Uh, Will Lowe, Simon Fraser University. And Hyman Bass has actually been joining us, uh, which is great. He sent he, uh, his flight was delayed. Uh, luckily, he had internet on his flight, and so he sent us a video uh, from 60,000, whatever, in the air. Um, so, hats off to Hyman for that. Um, so what, I want to, what we want to talk about today is this idea of, of speculative reasoning. And it's a term, I guess, that in some ways may be an introduction to some of you, but in some ways it's been very, very familiar to you, uh, particularly as designers and those involved in design, uh, in large part because design is inherently speculative. Speculative meaning is about the future. And we really think about what could exist. And really the kind of intent of the panel in part is to look at how maybe we can leverage this idea, this kind of fundamental notion of speculative reasoning, and really leverage it sort of in the context of who was talking about design research and research and design, and how we can take this approach and really put it at the basis of our inquiry. And as you'll see, it actually resonates very much with just the general notion of inquiry and the research that we do. But let me just kind of go through with this very briefly, to show you how speculative reasoning is something that's so fundamental to us as designers. This is an example here of a grocery store, and you think about what we do today and how we shop, and how food is brought to our table, it's produced somewhere, it's harvested, it's grown, distributed through stores, we collect it, we pay for it, we bring it home, we prepare, and of course, this is an example from Phil's Design Pro, it's called Biosphere Farm. And they looked at the brief of what would the kitchen of the future be in 2020. And so the Biosphere Farm is at the top, you have herbs and vegetables, and then and, and, and the nutrients from the water that flows down. You can't really see it because it's very dark, but there's actually an aquarium at the bottom where there's fish. And so the nutrients flow down, they feed the fish, the waste from the fish gets recycled back up. And you're actually harvesting there now and to the future. Not only do you not, you, you not have to distribute the food, you actually grow and produce the food in the same place in which you could. And this is a classic design notion. How might we improve, how might we create something that's preferred in the future? And how do we go about that? And I'll give you another example. This is sort of looking back and how we look forward. So this is an example of the Night Raiders, which was 1994. And you're considering the capital newspaper. For more than 500 years, ink printed on paper has been the best medium for delivering written information. But as the world becomes increasingly digital, all that is changing. Here at the Night Reader Information Design Lab in Boulder, Colorado, a team of journalists, designers, technologists, and researchers is putting together the tools that will take today's newspaper into the electronic age. We will have the interactive graphic now. So when you click on the graphic on the front page, or you click on the story. Roger Fiddler established the lab for Night Reader in the fall of 1992. Today, he serves as its director. Our role is to investigate the opportunities that may be there for these different companies over the next few years and to also try to develop a long-range vision of where the newspaper industry is headed over the next 5, 10, 20 years. An important part of this evolution is the emergence of the electronic tablet. This device is under development at consumer electronics companies around the world. Tablets will be a whole new class of computer. They'll weigh under two pounds. They'll be totally portable. They'll have a clarity of screen display comparable to ink on paper. They'll be able to blend text, video, audio, and graphics together. And they'll be part of our daily lives around the turn of the century. Wow. So this is a good example of the kind of feature in design in large part they got it right. And if you think that one of the things point 
how they did this, and you can see they had a group of people essentially around the table, really an emphasis on an analytical emphasis over empirical reasoning, trying to actually understand drawn past work, drawn past exemplar, and through a level of kind of analytical engagement, theorize about what might come, and work from there and embed that and embody that in design practice. And so the very notion of kind of analytical reasoning or speculative reasoning is, as I said, very much part of what we understand as design. We all understand this through design scenarios, conceptual prototyping, featuring, technology road mapping, and so on and so on. And the thing that we come to value with this idea of featuring, at least in most of our practices, is the degree to which is predictive. Even then, I just showed you a video to show how predictive it was. It tends to be technology driven. We tend to look at the technology and say, well, what is that going to bring us in the future? And we really try to look at existing trends to see what the near future probability of that is. And as, as designers, we tend to op we want to optimize and we want to make that actually come to reality. So this is a form of speculative reasoning. This is something that, again, is so fundamental what we do. But I think the much what we're going to argue this afternoon is that the emphasis here is more on the reasoning, the analytical reasoning, as opposed to the speculative. And we see that it has limits. And the argument is to bring this analytical reasoning really very much to the forefront of the way in which we do research and push it further. So I'm going to show you, this is a short video by Anthony Dunn, and, and Dunn and Ravi just recently came up with both speculate everything. But there's a nice job of actually articulating where we so might go. Especially in design, when we think of the future, we think very much of predicting the future and forecasting it, and trying to absolutely figure out what is going to happen. It's very much about trying to identify probable futures. That's what we're trying to do as designers. Our education, our professionalism, our design methods, our awards are all geared towards doing this, whether it's new needs we might have in a few years or, or new markets. Once you move away from that, there's much more interesting space. There's the space of, um, I'll see my computer, potential futures. And this is the space of scenario building. For example, in the 70s, um, the oil company, Dutch Shell, used to generate alternative future world visions, not to try and predict the world that was going to take shape, but to make sure that if one of, say, five different worlds were to take shape, their company could continue to thrive in those worlds. So we take into consideration mass economic shifts, wars, famines, things like that. So we're still very much dealing with modeling reality, but a number of different realities rather than one. I guess the space I'm interested in is the one of our possible futures, which is where a lot of science fiction happens. It's much more about imagining freely um, how the world can be different, how could they like to be different. And there's a kind of limits. I guess there is really this artificial line between the possible and whatever's beyond it. But I sort of think of that as the space of fantastic, of goblins, fairies, things like that. And the thing that distinguishes it for me is scientific uh, realism. That beyond that line is a world that scientifically just doesn't make sense. So I like graphic, it was hard to see, so here's recreation of it. This is actually based on uh, uh, Ben Arabi's interpretation of Stuart Candy, who's a futurist. It helps again, you can see that moving from the present, that much of what I was showing you before on those earlier slides is really trying to understand, speculate on the probable. But really the argument is to move from the probable to potentially even the possible. And that the Dunn says really the limits you hit upon this is in some respects a scientific limitation. And even then, that could be contested whether that really is the limit of which we speculate, science fiction, so on, we challenge some of that. But nevertheless, this is something that we actually really engage in. We actually do try to find that space to which, in which we inquire and find out what those limits are. And we really should be pushing those as far as we possibly can. So as I pointed out earlier, the kind of understanding and speculative reason that we have tends to be about probable futures. And if we really want to move out to this realm of the potential and the possible futures, and this may be widening the breadth of methods, widening the breadth of commitments, widening our understanding of how we might approach and bring speculative reasoning into our research. So, I actually really can't see it, it's just completely dark, but it's great out to move from predictive, as I showed you before, as now being fictive. This notion of really utilizing fiction and expanding the understanding of the possible, what are the possible worlds that might be out there, to moving from what was technology driven to being values driven as we shape the future, we might understand and actually play with, and actually even challenge and contest some of these moon values that we hold very dearly right now. Moving away from near future probability 
who are speculatively preferable. What is a preferable by whom, and how hard do we speculate on that? So these are some things we're talking about in the panels. How do we move beyond probable? How do we take analytical reasoning very much into the core of our research, and how do we move beyond probable? And so, no, so to summarize, to summarize, the reasoning and design research is speculative, value-driven, and about the possible to prefer. So let me give you an example from our own work. Uh, this is something in the everyday design studio that we've been working on. This is what we call table non table. Uh, it's a stack of paper, a pound of paper. It sits on an aluminum uh, chassis uh, with a, you can see in the center, there's an aluminum post that comes through, and this paper is just stacked on top. It's meant to get plugged into a wall. Um, it doesn't do it. What it does is it moves on occasion, maybe two times a day, or maybe five or ten seconds, maybe three times a week, maybe nine times a month, it's random. It has these slight movements. So what is this? What is the point of this? Well, really for us, it's an approach to research we call the concept artifact. And it's really just taken from Eric Stolzer and Nico Deeper. And the idea that you simultaneously craft and conceptualize certain ideas together and explore what you might do with those. And so we really wanted to explore the notion of what it is to be lived with and how things that we make, digital uh, interactions on artifacts, can enjoy and become part of practices. And there's not much that we can reason on based on empirical research, but we need to speculate and analytically understand how we might craft such a thing. And so we might have, this could be considered a material advantage of an artifact that balances certain tensions, in our case, the sort of defamiliarized, the alien and the familiar, a material imagining that balances the idea of being passive enough that you can live with it, but active enough that you don't forget it. So it's not enough just to speculate and even to make it in the studio, but of course it has to take it out into the wild. <laughs> it has to exist. And within the speculative reasoning, it doesn't mean that you detach from the rest of the world. It has an existence within our world. And so we deploy these into various households. What they might do, or what's to be done with it, we don't know. That's part of that reasoning. It's part of understanding what the probabilities might be, the possibilities and potentials. So this may be beyond human, in fact, when we captured it, what to do with it. Uh, but it was able to take the paper and play with it and so on. In fact, in that many ways, it actually inspired some of the, the owners to actually take it apart and they've done the various things, make snowflakes with it, draw on it, and do all kinds of things. But really what it is, is the speculation of what might be an encounter we shape and craft something, and what might be the encounter? And try to understand that. So, in putting this panel together, we put together, well, I put together a series of questions that ask each of the panelists, um, and they're going to try to address these questions. So, how do you describe speculative reasoning and design? What are examples of speculative reasoning and design from your own work and others? And what contributions can speculative reasoning and design make to HCI? So with that, I'm going to now hand the floor over to Mark McClay.
made some feel cozy in our street. So this is a world where you know there are data trails, so you're leaving data traces wherever you're going, but there are conventions which exist which make this you know something that's not necessarily uh, uh, something to worry about. There are conventions which make it okay. Um, so this, this, these kinds of scenarios in you look at some Asian world has been very influential, where in, in some senses we're living in, in, in the world that these scenarios described. Um, and a few years ago, uh, Genevieve Bell and Paul Durish uh, wrote a paper comparing these kinds of ubiquitous computing scenarios to science fiction. And the paper's called um, Resistance is, is Futile. And I'm trying to find that in my jet lag to hang this yesterday, I put it to Google. Research is futile. <laughs> That's like a But um, they described these, these five shows uh, that they grew up watching. One was uh, Star Trek, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The other was Doctor Who, which uh, you may know. And then Blade 7, which you probably don't know if you're not from, from England. But in Star Trek, uh, the kind of future that's imagined is very utopian. Uh, there's a federation uh, that exists where you know, people can plant spaces harmoniously, the problems on Earth have been solved, uh, you know, you've got an interracial crew, there are no money problems. Uh, it's it's a, a very utopian and optimistic vision. Um, and it's very typically you know, English, uh, the, the doctor vision is essay. So the title basically doesn't work. It looks like that uh, police box there because the chameleon circuit, which is supposed to make it blend in when it lands somewhere. Uh, it doesn't work. And in Blade 7, uh, it's basically a poor man's Star Trek. It's basically the same show with seven people uh, in a spaceship having you know, various encounters and adventures. But the Federation that they know is pursuing them. So this is a dystopian future. It's very unique and very depressing, and everything's awful, and it's total state surveillance. And you know, none of this American optimism thank you very much. It's very bleak and awful future, it's, it's, it's what you've got. And what Ben and Jurish uh, point out with as they talk about these different shows is that uh, they all foreground the social and political and cultural context, whatever that might be. So whether it's a utopian vision or a distributed one, it's there. And they say that this is something that's missing when you have a typical uh, Ubicon scenario. It's a pretty faceless user. Uh, 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 you know, uh, banal kind of uh, uh, setting. Um, but that isn't to say that there's no social context imagined. There is. It's just uh, downplayed. And they they want to make this distinction here uh, between research that uh, foregrounds these social and cultural contexts and these kinds of uh, political kinds of concerns, and, and those that, that downplay it and suppress it. Um, so I thought it would be quite interesting to take some of those wiser cell scenarios and rewrite them in the style of science fiction. So wiser took the term, uh, you know, uh, ubiquitous computing from a Philip K. Dick novel called Ubik. Uh, and Ubik in this novel is a, a, a kind of aerosol spray, which is totally multifunctional and it's described in very strange ways as you know, doing all kinds of um, uh, contradictory things. Um, and he, you know, used that, that word to talk about the, the all pervading computing environment that we, we now live in. Um, but I took these, these characters in this world, which in Philip K. Dick is very dystopian, and, and put the same technologies that Wiser was talking about into this world. Um, and it comes out very differently. Um, so Philip K. Dick always begins with a, you know, a blue collar worker who hates his job, who's living in a world that he doesn't really understand, and two big starts off like that as well. So taking that cell scenario where, you know, uh, she wakes up and, and gets coffee, so does uh, Joey Chip here, um, but he has a hangover. And he says, why didn't you wake me up like I asked? And the alarm clock replies, the cost of a wake up call is five cents. And he says, I told you I didn't have any change anyway, it's a maturity, it's a good tip, I don't have to do it. And the alarm clock argues and says, well, I think otherwise. Um, and then he's like, just give me a coffee, 50 cents please, and he just has the money. And you know, this kind of foreground is something that is very often left out of all of our scenarios. We just money. How do we pay for this? What happens if you can't pay for this? Who, who does this get excluded as well as um, included? 
Um, so this kind of incorporation of science fiction and, and this kind of broad vocabulary of scenario, scenario development is something which um, science fiction authors themselves have been coming on to design conferences and urging us to do. So um, Bruce Sterling is making the best name for um, uh, the difference engine which wrote with uh, William Gibson. Uh, coined the term design fiction in his 2005 book, Shaping Things. And uh, he's well been writing design fiction for years. Uh, uh, and the way that he defined it in, in those uh, early uh, years was that it just makes more sense on the page than science fiction does. And this was taken up by uh, Julian Pico, and he talked about uh, the idea of a diegetic prototype, a uh, prop from a film being interested not just because it shows you some kind of technology, but because it drives the story. Yeah? So um, you say it's like, you know, with, with Minority Report, the interesting thing about the technology is not just how it works or what, you know, uh, what the interaction is, but you know, how does this uh, thing work in the context of what happens in the story with the people. And so they took this on and, and uh, came up with this more formal definition of design fiction as the deliberate use of diagetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. So here's some examples. Uh, this one certainly uses uh, a bioprinted organ. Um, this is one of uh, Tim Dunn's uh, and, and Ken Ray's students, I think. Uh, he's talking about what, what, what will the music world look like if we can grow meat, then how would we design that to look appetizing? Uh, and corporations started to use this kind of technique as well. So you're getting people like Microsoft showing design fictions of their smart in the future, and you know, the Google Glass type fictions, how are, we, how are we going to use these? And then you kind of get into some difficult water in some ways, and um, people like uh, Eugene Morozov um, have started to critique this kind of uh, sometimes utopian thinking, particularly within the context of corporate development. So um, he's written a book called Click Here to Save Everything and talks about solutions, which is done for us from architecture. Um, and it's kind of defined as solving problems that don't really exist, or giving quick technological fixes for complex social and political problems, right? So um, he talks about the way that you know, self-monitoring technology, self-tracking technology, uh, consistently focuses in on the individual. It's, it's the individual person's uh, problem, they have to deal with it individually, if we're going to tackle the obesity epidemic, uh, then we need to kind of get people looking at how many you know, steps they're taking in a day. And he says that this kind of focus, uh, first of all, implies there's a technology quick fix or everything, that there's a technological silver bullet for everything, and there isn't. And it also kind of takes the pressure off, you know, other kinds of interventions. Well, should we be kind of regulating, you know, soft drinks and sorts or questions like that, right? And his favorite example uh, is bin can. So, um, Bingham is a uh, 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 mobile phone in it. And the idea is that uh, when the lid closes, it takes a photograph of the contents of the bin and sends that image to Facebook so your friends can see if you're recycling or not. And the idea was like maybe if there was a kind of social pressure going on, then people would be uh, more inclined to, uh, to recycle. So, um, Morisov gets very. Uh, uh, I rage like this, and you know, talks about this and some about how the geeks think the internet is going to save us all. Um, but here I can't part company with him because I think um, Bingham is a very interesting uh, research prototype. And the fact that it makes Morozov so angry is part of what makes it so interesting. And it sparked a huge uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, outcry <coughs> in uh, the press in Britain. And she you knows right wing tabloid newspapers said, Oh, the, the, the government is going to spy on your bin now. Uh, and there's nothing, uh, you know, and, and the responses of the readers were also very interesting. Uh, and and showed what a kind of uh, complex issue that it is, and very deeply held beliefs come into uh, play. And you know, people, you know, who are climate change deniers and people like that were saying, You know, you can pull the, 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 the coke can that I need to recycle from my cold dead hand. And all that stuff is very interesting and wouldn't have been discussed, I don't think, without that. So I think it's more interesting rather than that because it's thought in that way and because it's solutionist in that way, to the extent that it is. So it kind of begs the question well, what's the point of a prototype? Like? Why do we make things? Why do we do these designs? Why do we put these you know, new, strange things into people's hands? What's the point of them all? And this is something that we're kind of um, still, I think, as a community, uh, 
decide in. Um, but it certainly isn't always the case that we're trying to kind of test out some new product, that we're trying to test out some you know, new potential market. I think if Bingham had been made by uh, Facebook, then that would be a very different kind of question. If they were going to put that out as some sort of solution, that would be very certain. Um, but what we're trying to do, I think, when we, when we do uh, these kinds of speculative designs, is to generate knowledge, not necessarily uh, solutions, right? Uh, and Bill Gaver in a, a paper uh, a couple years ago um, pointed out that, you know, anyone, what kind of knowledge is it? Because it's not peaceful, it's not generalizable, right? So, um, one of the things I've used design fiction for is to try and frame answers to those kinds of questions. It's a book by a, a science fiction writer called Sen Salven called Imaginary Magnitude, where he kind of writes a conference proceedings for a conference of the future and you know, has abstracts from, uh, from that conference and presentations from it. And um, it's kind of a nice way to kind of frame a concept design and think, well, shall I make it in this way or not? So for various projects we've before, we start actually making things, written up what the abstract for the paper might look like and what the point of it might be. Um, so I think to go back to the kind of um, problem of solutions, I think design fiction can be used to help uh, address that charge, but I don't think it's one that we should be that frightened of, really. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the term of solutionism is one that we kind of, in a way, need to hold our hands up to. It's like, well, clearly we are not going to solve the problems of the environment with some technology. And clearly there are dangers on the side, and we don't have too much power to serve them value. But yet we are engaged in design practices, we do want to kind of explore these uh, new uh, possibilities and so on. And so I think, you know, okay, let's, let's not be too afraid of that, of that term. It's kind of like, it reminds me of um, when uh, the Impressionists, the French painters, uh, were first called Impressionists. This was an insult. This was a term of abuse. But it kind of stuck because it, it, yeah, right, it, it's an Impressionist kind of, uh, you know, practice. So maybe what we're doing is a solutionist kind of um, practice. And I think that's probably why design fiction is, is becoming more um, popular and why more and more people are kind of engaged in it. Um, unlike a scenario, and unlike a persona, it insists on its fictional status, and then can help bring in those other, you know, social and cultural uh, uh, contexts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, you didn't, well, you didn't say it yet. Uh, are there any questions for Mark? Yes. Okay. So, uh, how does that? Yeah. 
of, of the tablet. Because, um, you know, that's so right in some ways, but also so wrong. And the bits that miss a world is how they, it's going to be spying on you, maybe reading your emails, maybe telling people where you're going and what you're doing. And, you know, that, that kind of social and cultural implication doesn't get thought about unless you're thinking more along the lines of dystopia. So, how do you decide? So, I mean, you see all the people working there, the press is printing out all the paper they're out on. Thank you. 
different from the uh, design scenarios. But I think that um, when, especially when designers have very clear vision about what future should be uh, or what future can be, so when the designers have a, with a full determination for both orientation of what the future is, then uh, the designers also try to describe them in you know, uh, the way of narratively or feature-based way or concept or prototype image is the uh, left end of uh, this line. And the right, uh, opposite the right uh, line, line of this, right side of the design, when there uh, are designers who try to minimize speculative reasoning, uh, which mostly were data-driven design. So we, actually, we start to, uh, we already have seen have been seeing many um, trials in this end, especially when we have a sensor available and many data available uh, online and um, many mobile companies and like a company like Google who can easily get user data and they try to interpret what data means to improve their next um, version of their product. So, but of course we also have uh, many, many um, approaches in the middle But well, for my part, I would like to talk about a little bit different uh, side of this line, uh, where we designers uh, don't have full imagination or full vision of what the future should be. Actually, uh, for the ones who took the, who, who have been here for the conference from the starting point to now, we have been talking about the Internet of Things and what that future should be with the Internet of Things and what are possibilities. Uh, we talked about that, but uh, I also seen that a lot of troubles and frustrations of what exactly the future should be, that, uh, especially for the pe uh, people side rather than technological side. So when we don't have a clear future, it means that in a way we don't have um, the, uh, even for the um, speculative, speculative reasoning, the designers unclear idea of um, for what they should be reading about. So uh, i like to, uh, it, it comes to the next question, uh, but I slightly changed this question since I'm talking about no reading and speculative reasoning, so I changed it to this. What are examples of no reasoning on shaping future design practice? So that's uh, the, the, the technique that we have developed called discovery driven prototype a few years ago actually uh, would be an interesting example for me for me to talk about this uh, aspect. So with discovery driven prototyping we uh, designers provide a prototype that is designed with no presumptions of what it should do between the what the future should be and aim to enable users themselves to discover new opportunities of what are possible. students and former students, there's some team and there's some job, and also uh, current PhD students who move for this. So uh, I will just simply, uh, just quickly show you three examples of this discovery of prototyping. Uh, one example is called Engemi. Uh, it's actually a sound mimicking word, and I'm at the end. Let me show you how
Uh, I'm a student from Seoul National University. And my question is, you said you were designing the, you, you, you and your students were designing the product carefully, but you're letting the users, users to decide what the purpose of the product, okay? And my question is, what were your principles for designing those of your three products? Tactile and tactical media um, experts. 
questions. And these are things that allow us to ask questions by sort of surfacing some of the different ways in which artists, craftsmen, um, and people who have some exposure to, to making in their lives start to formulate new ways of, of making meaning through material. And the last set, which I'll focus on today, is what I'm kind of playfully calling these anti-acts. Um, so this is actually going to draw into the themes we already discussed, the, the adapting of use we just talked about, and then the solution is even more so. So I'm going to focus on one uh, technology called Trace that um, I recently built with my group um, that looks at the kind of today's uh, orientation towards a map and really what we could ask today about the same technology if we saw it less as solutionist in more of such terms and maybe more as a technological unfix. This is his term for thinking about not just unblack boxing the technology, but also kind of trying to understand how we can provoke questions about it through, through this unmasking. And so what we started with was a simple idea of taking GIS and engaging deeply with uh, a body of theory that starts to unpack how we walk and through our, our everyday landscapes. And what we started to do is work with this notion of wayfaring that Tim Engle produces that's really uh, focused on this itinerant mapping that's not just about getting somewhere, right, the destination-oriented travel, but about exploring and ne necessarily improvising as we explore. So always surfacing a new trajectory and remap the way. So the question is then, how could we design the same with the same tools, a way of, of guiding wandering rather than destination-oriented travel? So we came up with something that's called Trace. It's a mobile mapping application that generates walking routes based on digital sketches people create without a map, and they annotate. And then they can send those traces to others, so those walking routes become uh, modes of communication. And if you can play this video, So to begin with, on the walking, or sorry, the drawing side, we see um, a simple drawing here, a shape um, is used to just describe a, a simple path that would then be able to be annotated along specific points on that path. So that annotation would take the form of digital media, form of text. And as those an annotations accumulate, since they're oriented on a path, they become kind of narrativized in the sense that one is coming after the other and produces a kind of story. So afterwards, this is then sent to uh, a friend, a loved one, maybe someone that you do not know. And the, the idea is that as the digital sketch is produced, it could be anywhere that that person picks it up. So they first choose how much time they want to walk note that it's not the distance in this case, and then follow the path that the trace is providing. So the idea is, again, that you don't know where we're, we're going to be oriented along this path, um, but then as we, it unfolds, so does this final message, right? That could take the form of 20 city blocks or three. So the resolution um, is also quite interesting in how it's shaping. So again, just walking through, this is a simple orientation towards sketching, annotation, and sending, which we're very used to in UCI context. And on the other side, thinking about just selecting the amount of time of walking. And this is not something that we looked at in di very different kinds of cities in the United States. So uh, we recruited 16 folks in pairs and guys across Chicago and Seattle and Boston. And if anyone has visited these cities, you already know that the topography is quite different, the density of the cities are different, the makeup right, of those cities is different. So a lot of the questions that came out of this were about thinking how these walks themselves began to transform for the people using them, um, using the trace. So first, engaging walks as creative events, people not just enjoyed looking at the, the walking routes themselves at the end, but certainly Show, sort of showing off the quality of their drawing skills. So this actually ended up coming out with a number of people who drew the two-masted sailboat a number of times because that was the one thing they felt they could draw. 
But in other ways, it became a moment to spend time handcrafting something in a, in a sense that the annotations and the, the, the drawing came together. But what sort of speaks to some of the themes that we already talked to is this orientation that people felt towards going somewhere quickly and doing it for a purpose that they had already come up with in, in, in the first moment of using that position. So the fact that, as one, this one person said, it feels unnatural to walk the same path. I usually, people only walk down the same path if they're making a mistake. This is a, almost an obvious statement to us now today, thinking that, that mistakes happen when you reverse and, and turn back. But when did this occur, and how, how is it that we've become a sort of resistant, right, to this notion of revisiting and, and rewalking? So that's something kind of a little unexpected that Albert might pull up in service for this person. And uh, a more central piece, though, that I think it becomes actually about where we're taking the project now is no, noticing how walking is really about community building. It's about participating in the space and about feeling that one has rights to participate in that space. And as this person said, it made me think about how I take for granted that the sidewalks belong to me as anyone else, that wherever we are, that we have the right to be there and that I belong as much as anyone. And so these notions of belonging and space in itself as, as represented by a map, it becomes something to be taken up and owned is quite interesting, I think. So as kind of moving forward to where this, this speculative reasoning might be headed, we think maybe that the notion of improvising while using something that's as pre-described pre and pre-specified as an algorithm is now something we can challenge through the technology itself. And how can we ask people to interact with the tool in ways that begins to point to other, other modes and challenges for doing this work? But I also think that we could actually pull together this notion of algorithms with Wayfaring to, to see how uh, that this idea of a Wayfarer that might be in control of certain aspects and let the, the environment and the social cues shape those is something central in all of our work, whether it be walking or using the tool. And lastly, I think pretty important is this notion of discrimination by design, that in the tool itself, as we're reinforcing some of the ways in which boundaries happen on maps, we're actually making those decisions for our users, right? So a lot of what we found while using this is how people come um, to, to feel and, and show off discriminatory behaviors through their choices to follow or not follow or contest what they see on the map. So um, with that, I want to end with this idea of social inquiry that design helps bring forth. Um, and one important feature of this is that, again, it's projecting to a future, right? So why is this different then from other forms of research that we can see at CHI. Why is this producing different kinds of knowledge? Well, I think first, as we're using these speculative constraints and possibilities, we're also producing interjections into the lived experience. And so as part of this, we're, we're researching the now, we're also actually pointing to the future and the possible. And this is now the, the, the further thinking that, that Tony Dunn and Jim Ravey have described. So that's distinct in the sense that the, that the rich, big description that we might uh, perceive for a project like this sound goal that's well scratching the surface and here at um, Happy New Year produces some kind of notion that's different from our everyday and that we can understand those environments differently. The other thing is that it, it is really oriented towards trends, and that this is something that's now uh, instead aims to answer questions specific to how social circumstances might change, right? So it, it's not about the what, how much, um, but more about the why and the how circumstances could be different. So thanks again for continuing this discussion. I'm excited to the, the 
good in yellow. The question if you're good in yellow, well, go get set. Yes. Well, then you've got to work with anti app tonight. I mean, I like your app and other people's cool app, so what's, what's an anti app and why is it possible? Yeah, so it's, it's meant to serve as what, what I was describing as this technological unfix to sort of think about what's underneath the surface of some of these tools. So, and I mean that in a couple ways. One way is that uh, walking itself has been, as we just described, it's kind of quantified itself and it's, it's pointing us towards more and more kind of ways to account for how much we have walked. So that, that question of kind of give me a, sp a specific orientation for why I'm going to do something. And in this case, we're, we're exploring the social aspects of walking, right? So we're looking at it quite differently. So there's not going to be that same space to, to orient towards a really gamified Thread and um, their research 
to. And so really, it's just, just this idea of pushing us to embody some particular stances or particular, particular um, ways of approaching design within material things. And so I'm actually not going to get into the specifics of what these do, but the idea of this like, suite of artifacts um, is that it, it's, maybe these, are, these could be kind of technologies or representation of things um, that persist within our lives over a longer time period. Um, does it necessarily mean that they're good? Uh, so it's always about kind of also exposing where possible tensions might lie. Um, and so really what this is about is just kind of having things that um, have a story to go with them. Um, so that story can evolve around the making of the thing and what it represents and kind of this fact that it's kind of pushing us to design technologies that um, might embody our kind of digital residue beyond our own lifetimes. But it's also about how that story kind of intersects with people's lives too, and how it kind of is taken up and where that narrative continues. Um, and so in a lot of all, like the efforts I've been pushing forward is kind of looking at the design artifact and side of the inquiry, but also including it within people's everyday lives to continue on that narrative and see where it goes and see what the possible fit all point um, they were to come out of it. Um, and so in the context of this project, it's really about um, well, what would it even look like to create something that might be able to persist long enough um, as a material or heirloom, or would we even want to do that? Um, another project that I won't talk about too much here, but just to mention, also is this the photo box project, which is looking at really this lens of slowness and what might that mean if embodied within a computational thing. And so the, the main point that I want to hit on here is that it's about speculating on a radically different alternative of what technology could be and what human relations to technology could be. And so um, this, is, this computational artifact really is, is something that only occasionally prints out one of your photos. Um, it has no interface. The, inter the owner has no control over it. Um, so, you know, the, 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 even though these are kind of like quite contrasting notions to what contemporary consumer devices tend to offer and are kind of quite parallel or um, quite opposite, the idea here was really to um, explore what would happen if we were forced to materially articulate this idea of slowness, this design theoretical idea um, within a computational thing. And so, again, here, the artifact becomes the site of inquiry, um, just as how it's lived experience, its existence within people's lives do too. And so it's really about exploring again, kind of possibilities that might open up, and also things that might obscure in people's lives, and how that continuing narrative um, interplays with the actual thing itself. And I think that that's one important way that speculative reasoning can really work to uncover New ideas is that kind of dialogue of this material existence with this making. Um, so, both of those projects really dealt with physically instantiated, polished things, things that worked, and um, really kind of a key part of it is the fact that they were real and functioning and in people's lives and had this kind of material existence. Um, but for the last part of this presentation, I actually want to talk about um, a different approach called user enactments which really aims to um, engage people in experiencing various different potential futures kind of in a much more rapid fashion. And really, in all of these cases, dystopian futures that we don't really think we want to bring into existence, but provide a critical attention to have more discussions about well, why it isn't the case. Um, and so, when doing user enactments, the design team, the research team will prototype multiple simulated representations of potential technological futures. And so then we bring people in to the, the setting where they are asked to enact loosely scripted scenarios that involve what might be kind of a familiar situation um, where a new and unfamiliar technical system is going to intervene in some way. And so the key points here is that these design concepts become kind of the mechanisms to explore these scenarios they have this serially, and people are kind of like exposed to four or five rather really quickly. And really, the aim here is to push people beyond their comfort zone um, to speculate on what possible fears and tensions might be in possible futures that we can bring into existence. Um, really, as a way of thinking about, well, where might social boundaries exist um, in spaces that we have little understanding of? Um, and so
So just two quick examples um, from this project. So previously I've been doing some field work with teenagers just in their bedrooms and getting a sense for um, how they're using technology and um, appropriate and how uh, really just the role of technology in teen life. And so starting to kind of see some interesting things. So there's this kind of desire to amplify the presence of um, digital stuff in their lives, especially this kind of voice is it's always on kind of Facebook culture. Um, just to kind of monitor what's going on in their social lives. And, um, and also, to an extent, drawing on their digital stuff as a way of reflecting on their past and, and really um, in quite like, concerted detail, kind of, um, manipulating their different presentations of self to different audiences all at the same time. And so, these are kind of interesting things, but the, the, the question that was often coming up for me is well, where, where does this point us to with an HCI research, which is often very kind of directed? And, looking for design action like, immediately. Um, and kind of when thinking about these things, like amplifying the presence of technology in teens' lives, it's really cool. What kind of future are they interested in bringing about? And um, should we really kind of try to challenge that or kind of critically inquire into it in a way um, of thinking about it with them in dialogue? So we pretty tied to this teen bedroom that was kind of the backdrop of these space explorations. Uh, so we're just kind of involved looking through these various different past and future images, getting a sense of kind of the aesthetic of teen life in their bedrooms, um, sketching out over 100 different, not just design concepts, but these kind of social scenarios in which kind of technology was interjecting, um, and also just kind of prototyping the bedroom itself. So really the idea was to create this place where teens might just temporarily suspend belief of kind of this mix of low and high fidelity materials, um, and then kind of explore these, these different enacted scenarios really quickly. So just to give you a really quick glimpse at what two of them are. One was the auto-redecorated bedroom. Um, so this was one where a team comes home and is voiced with the task of finishing reading this last chapter from Anna Juliet before uh, her friend comes over to study for exam later that night. So she's reading away and in the background she has this all this whole array of personal tailored to her, the system is done. And then when her friend shows up, the screen is chained automatically and signed this like creepy curated collection of all these different exchanges and things that happened between them. Um, and so there's like even some things that come for CA on here. And her friend that enters the room, which is played by a researcher, and the patient's most kind of improvised dialogue about what's occurring um, here on the screens. And then momentarily the dad shows up and uh, knocks on the door and at this point in time the screens automatically change to something that's much more um, family friendly you could say. And so then uh, dad comes in and eventually drops off the laundry and um, in the enactment comes to the club. So okay. really the point here was actually just um, probing on the acceptability of this idea of how it's curated constantly sense of self and conversion of boundaries of physical and digital identities um, with no intention of really building this out, um, but as a way of kind of uh, engaging in a dialogue about, like, well, is this a kind of future that teens might desire? Um, but really quick, the last one is this idea of the postcards from the past, so having a system that just generates these postcards um, based on your social network or media experiences over the past several years and then you receive them in the mail a few years later, um, and they have these kind of summaries of things that happen to you. They're not always good, you know, but um, it's also these rote um, collections of different content things that's happened, how many times you want to tag yourself. And so, again, the idea here was just to see, um, to have teens confront the material reality and receive this information from the past to open this discussion about um, a future where there's an unseen record it's happening, it's on the end of self-disclosure, um, kind of amplified. Um, so again, the aim here was just not to actually build these things out, but to engage in this kind of critical discussion. Um, and it's my really point. So, just as a closing point, so what is the reasoning and design for HCI, and what does it offer? So a few ideas, well one, is that it can catalyze some critical debates about what the code exists. And so it's going to happen in important ways uh, among researchers and people, but also importantly among the HCI academic community itself. Um, it can support the crafting and design of artifacts themselves in the form of theoretical articulation and intellectual argumentation, 
is something about where we don't do enough of. Um, and then the last point is that it can expand research contributions in design beyond design. So it's the idea that um, this kind of work still can produce meaningful takeaways for design practice, um, but when you don't have that as a requirement from the starting point, um, it can also reveal other kinds of insights and produce other kinds of engagements that might get more of the social, political, or even like ethical issues that are bound to creating technology and bring it into existence. Um, and maybe that's something that we need now in HDI more than ever. So I'll just leave it. Okay, well, are there any questions for Will? I mean, it, it almost occurred to me more like less in the abstract, but when I was here presenting and seeing these images, 
Um, and especially the ones of the people uh, going with the seatbelt. Uh, and uh, it's like really compelling. And, uh, and it almost seems as though uh, it's, it's this kind of speculative vision or like argument about the need for technology that's like simple enough to be repurposed or resourcefully drawn on in life, everyday life in general. And then it's like in the seductive nature of each of your designs to the qualities of the really thing that brought that out for me. So I was just curious if you Actually, uh, when I was putting no reasoning there, I was also a little bit struggling whether it's right to put no reasoning there or not. Uh, but with, the reason that I put no reasoning was that um, the discovery driven try not to define any specific future from the design side. And so, um, the in usual, when we do the reasoning um, activity in design, we try to figure out uh, what possible future can be and try to create that through many different um, kind of uh, approaches that can inspire us to imagine about future and also we can also even we have, when we have a vision of what the future should be, uh, we use the materials or other kind of tools and approaches to help us to actually manifest that idea uh, clearly. And then when thinking about the traditional ways of doing the design activity in that regard, when I was thinking about discovery during the prototyping, uh, the process of uh, that process seems to be the trying to create the future in terms of trying to create the future, it's very different because we try not to assume any future by ourselves try to create the discovery of your prototypes. And so um, if that is the purpose, and then if I try to say, so I mentioned that in certain sense, actually, we use the maximum speculative reasoning because we don't have anything to draw upon uh, because we don't try not to imagine the future by the designer side. So, um, because that's a purpose we have, if that is, if reasoning is based on that, it actually, it's a, we use the maximum shape of reasoning. But when we think about the image the future, we actually have no reasoning for what future should be. So that's why we use the term no reasoning. But um, interestingly, I, I, we realized that the um, people actually probably had an experience of uh, speculative reasoning users who have a prototype in their uh, context. So um, to me, to us, actually, that was an interesting thing because um, the, that kind of meaning-making process, in a way, encouraged by the way that we try for people. So in that regard, actually, all of, well, all of us talked about, uh, in a way, the online of aligned with that line, I think. Um, so I was thinking that the anti-app, <laughs> the trace, uh, and Daniela talked, was about, uh, talked about was interesting as well, because the people actually, uh, it's not about solving their, uh, the, uh, some kind of problems, and the practical problems they have, but they try to create some new meanings out of using that and reflect upon um, kind of new experience that might be given to the kind of so kind of creating that kind of apps, uh, the process of creating that apps might be aligned with the process of creating this over the project as well. So, yeah. okay, I have a, a question for, for, for each of the panelists. And um, I think I actually may pick up a point that, that James raised at the very beginning in response to Mark. I mean, it's, it's a question of, of judgment. Um, and that within we're talking about the second of reasoning, in fact, maybe one of these you can see it as an opposition to say user centered design. It's an opposite that in fact not what we talked about really has these sort of stakeholders or users in which they actually that sterilization judgment comes to certain users, etc. So where does judgment fit in this? Uh, how do you decide whether we should go ahead with speculating about this particular thing or what things you should speculate on or not? So I'm just curious how anyone get comment on that. I, I think that's a very important 
your question is concerned. Um, I'm not sure how your, your thing is playing out here, because I think it's that your table, um, I mean, your, your Facebook box uh, will have a cat set up, and also your table and table had a cat. So, is that a conservative design for cats? <laughs> Well, I think the, the, the judgment aspect of, of this uh, is, is crucial, really. And um, I think when you're asking questions about what you actually make and what you deploy, it's very important to be clear about what your research question is with this kind of work. And so with um, the uh, imaginary abstracts uh, that we wrote, uh, one of them uh, was, I, I worked with um, a PhD student who was working on techniques for trying to do designs which uh, support uh, spiritual practices. And um, we thought it might be kind of funny to do uh, an eBay roulette system. And we were thinking about you know that um, bit in the Bible where a rich man goes up to Jesus and, and says, how should I follow you? And he says, give away all your stuff. And the guy just goes away sad. Um, we thought we could support that very difficult injunction um, with an eBay related system. And we were also thinking about Buddhists, you know, we, we need to turn away from all the samsara and services and distractions. And so. so we thought, what if there was like a, an eBay related system uh, where you would enter into a database, all of your possessions, and it would choose one of them, sell it on eBay for the, the most it could, and give the money to charity. And we kind of thought that was kind of a nice idea, but really just a bit, you know, the, you know, the kind of critical design that, that makes one point and one point only you know, And so we thought, no, that's not actually going to, you know, particularly answer any research question. And so when we were writing up the, the imaginary abstract, it was like, well, something kind of offensive and trivialized in the vision. We said, well, one person might like it, because, you know, maybe that's not beyond the realm of possibility there. But I think um, in terms of judgment, I think there's, there's that, that well, what's the research question we're trying to answer aspect to it? But there's also a question, I think, of interpretation with this kind of work, because, you know, I think sometimes um, a speculative design or a critical design um, needs to be engaged with in, in, and interpreted in, in many different ways. Uh, and that's something that we're not very good at talking about in next year, uh, evaluating something as a success or a fail, because people like it, people don't. And I think there's another, another aspect to it, um, which is more interpretive. Yeah, I, I was actually going to go in a similar direction, thinking about it though, on a, and instead of the sort of user centered design maybe spectrum, thinking about sort of the development of the idea and how that development happens. Um, obviously, there's judgment as part of making decisions as to what is and is not, what is and is not appropriate and, and ethical and all these various things. And that's, that's something that um, you could do based on empirical work, right? You could based on theoretical work, based on responding to uh, technology, based on your experience prior to this, doing other kinds of practices. So it's interesting to think about all the various influences that come into that judgment, but then also on the interpretation end, I think there's a tendency to think about interpreting the object from the designer's perspective um, in the design research kind of moment, and that's maybe different if we start to, again, use uh, other people
probably Christian Israel. Um, so the one of the big challenges as a design researcher around this kind of idea, the speculative reasoning um, in this HCI community is that because the speculative reasoning in a way forces us not to be empirically you know, reasoning about the discoveries that are that we are trying to get uh, through our research. And so how then this, the quality of speculative reasoning can be judged or assessed and evaluated it would be an interesting question for us to think about as a design researcher. And I don't have answer, no, <laughs> but we see some of the good examples coming out actually in HCI, but it would be an interesting question for us to have Responses and kind of comes out of a, a community uh, practice that has has expertise and competencies, and um, and that's like why we have these these committees that are full of people that have been working on the practice of design and social design and research, and, and I think that really that's where judgment comes in. I mean, it, it's kind of like it seems like it's, it's something that just speaks to you, um, and it's. It, it, it kind of has a decision to be an analytical framework that will tell us if it's great, you know, a great job or not. I mean, it's kind of almost like, well, it's dependent on various factors. It's dependent on how the material composition of the whole comes together, how the thing itself operates in the form of argumentation, um, and how it kind of resonated with people, perhaps, and how the, this whole element, these various elements come together into what we often judge the, the final research part of that, which is the paper. And it's not really kind of a clear way of just you know, uh, assessing them in a you know, completely formalized session. Yeah, is there, I mean, I think I'll just any questions. So I think we'll kind of bring this to a close, but I think the one thing that, that, that just actually kind of comes full circle because we talked about these opening slides that have been going beyond the probable. And we talked about the probable, one of the key aspects of it was to what degree your teaching is predictive. And there was your measure right there. And, and, was, and, and you cross it into the probable we talked about, the potential possible injury of a And now we're at a whole level of kind of interpretive judgment. And, and I think maybe that the question then is not only so much what can we, but how do you, in, you talked about a large community like I or ACI, how do you actually, without these external measures, that go beyond consensus and quality. Well, you know, unless you reach a level of consensus that you're talking about, how do you act? And I think that's really kind of important, important kind of question. So I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank all of you that stuck it out uh, for being here. So one last round of applause. <laughs>